Hi, this is a video on the game The Second World War by John Douglas Firer. It's available in a beautiful edition um, produced by One Small Step Games. I have um, the previous edition, which was a print and play, um, produced by Pan Genre Games. Uh, they're still in business, but you can't get this from them anymore. Although um, and uh, it was a print and play. Um, I'm not sure actually you might have to check. No, I guess it's not available as a print and play anymore. So, um, excuse the components. Like I say, One Small Step produced a brilliantly, um, really lovely looking game. Uh, what I'm going to present in this is uh, not so much the beauty of the components but just to explain what's in the game something a bit about how it works and then I will do another video of an example of play. So um, I'm going to concentrate on the Pacific Theatre. Um, it's a, a global war game um, you can so you can play the whole war for which you would have a Pacific Theatre map then you would have a strategic map. So that, as you can see, includes the Americas, um, the African uh, continent, um, the parts thereof, and then uh, various charts and displays. And then there would be another map of a comparable size to this one at a different scale, um, but the same size for the uh, Eastern Theatre. So you can play them all together or you can play separate theatres. Um, the game comes with a, a 66 or so page book, um, rule book, 20 pages of which are scenarios and examples of play. And uh, the Pacific Theatre you can play alone uh, from 1941 onwards. Um, you can play the European Theatre from 1941 onwards or there's a, a 1939 European Theatre scenario and there's some special the um, uh, rules for handling a commitment of the other theatre that you are not playing in those and then there are there's a 41 a third and a 39 scenario for the whole campaign the whole war there's also a mini training scenario, Barbarossa, and then, um, like I said, there's a couple of examples of play in the invasion of um, Poland and the midway battle to illustrate ground and air and sea movement and combat. Um, so, uh, first off, I think it, it's a great game. It does what it, it does really nicely. In it, it was aimed as a as a as a midway between um, world in flames and Axis and allies and it, and it is that it's definite steps up from Axis and allies in simulation value uh, and steps down from world in flames in uh, complexity. It plays very fast and the systems are uh, simple and easy to grasp in principle. However, and this is the uh, one and only and the major gripe I have with it is that the rule book, although it's clearly written, it is not referenced at all. So um, there is an index, but it um, is not written in cases. You just have um, essentially chapters and then paragraph headings. So um, you can see here's the index here. So every bold one here is is a sort of a chapter, so that's a chapter, that's a chapter, and then the, the headings underneath it. The, the trouble with this is um, for things like, if you, you start reading um, the rules and you get to, on the page seven, um, things like, okay, task force martyrs, maskers, that's helpful, what are they? See task forces, where is task forces? And then it's not um, sort of, it has a particular order, but it's the order that was suitable in the designer's mind, and it's not um, immediately apparent to me how the order works in the sense that um, the, the, if these were broken down to bigger sections, like, say, movement, 
see uh, something like that ground, then it would be quicker to hone in on that, but it's not. So um, I've had to go through referencing. It's the same thing with the um, uh, player edge sheets. The whole g well, most of the game is um, on these two player edge sheets and then on the various track tracks and displays and on the maps. Um, but again, player age sheets is, for example, actions requiring immediate supply check. Okay, that's your reminders, but where's the rules reference? I had to go through and put them all in myself. Also, and this is not a gripe on this game, but every single game, I just don't know why they don't put more on their player age sheets. Because um, I think people think, oh, I want it to look clean and clear. And then, okay, either produce another player age sheet or you've got to fit more on because there's essential things like movement rates, um, how you could say use resources. You have how you can use action points, but no reminder on how resources, which are different and can be used in different ways, are. For example, uh, then also like what support and attack means. Well, you get the picture. I had to add extra things in. Um, You've also got sort of details of supply, but no reminder on supply routes because, for example, in the European theatre, you have two jumps of two hexes on the Pacific, one hex, but from islands, ports to single hex islands is six naval movement points. So that's three essential things which are different depending on where you're looking, and you wouldn't remember that without the player's age or aid or having um, a lot of experience with the game. So those things always seem to get lost in uh, development and play testing because the designer, the playtester, the developer, they've all played the game a lot and they, they forget that a new person coming in needs these things often and frequently <laughs> until they get used to it. So um, that's my great. Uh, the only one outstanding is non-reference rule book and so, so I've had to go through I didn't do it painstakingly I just did it as I was relearning the game in the last two or three weeks um, I've played a sample game uh, just cross-referencing the rule book so I can find things okay now on to to the game so what do we have okay um, so I'll start here we have in the West Pacific and it's also on the European you have um, mega hexes and then the hexes in them so the hexes come in single hexes come into play in in the land and the mega hexes are for naval movement so any um naval units that move out so that's these naval units are in port there if they move out of the port then um they form a task force and uh a task force is anywhere in the naval that mega hex. It's an abstraction. So if an enemy task force moves into that hex, they can roll to detect each other and uh, you can place them, in essence, anywhere in that hex. It That does come into play in the sense that units in this mega hex, for example, air units, if they were on the edge, they might be able, they would normally have a patrol range in this mega hex and they might be able to um, depending on where they are, um, exert control range into that mega hex too. But otherwise it's just a broad abstraction. You consider that that's a, a naval hex and the smaller land hexes are only used for land units and air units, and that kind of necessity. So, um, And as as quick briefly pointed out before, the Pacific Theatre has different movement routes, mo movement rates, and so forth because um, it's a different scale from the European Theatre. It goes all the way from Siberia. You've got Vladivostok there. Then you have uh, Japan in uh, this 1941 uh, scenario, the Pacific Theatre one, the only Pacific Theatre alone scenario. Um, the only one you need really. They, they, they. The Japan already is in control of Manchuria and East China, um, and Korea. Then you have Japan itself here. Uh, you have China. You have Maoist China, Nationalist China, and then you have Burma, um, the French Indochina, um, Thailand, Malaya, British Borneo, the Philippines with American units in it. 
Netherlands, East Indies, you've got New Britain, uh, you've got Australia down here, over there you have India, um, uh, here we have Rabu, Port Moresby, you've got the island chain going down there, Guadalcanal, and you can see you've got lots of what they call one hex islands dotted out in the sea all the way down to New Zealand there. Um, you have uh, Carolines here, you've got Iwo Jima there, Saipan Guam, Minami, Torishima, so Wake, uh, Midway, and there's Hawaii. Um, you've got the Marshalls, the, Gil the Gilberts, uh, those are the Solomons. And then you go all the way up to Kamchatka there and the Aleutians there. Now um, you can see that um, there are islands of group, one hex islands are grouped into island groups. So um, you can control a whole island group or just one thereof. Um, and uh, there's special rules essentially handled in terms of stacking and um, movement and so forth, determining uh, one hex islands as compared to standard hex um, uh, land masses. Um, you also have, you have marked on the map, um, convoy routes. So Japan already has convoy routes marked on the map. This is, so it's abstract that you don't have to have counters, you don't have to build it yourself, you don't have to control it yourself. They're purely there. Um, if uh, the Allies um, put submarine units on those routes, they can start interdicting them. In, in fact, they could um, interdict them with um, naval units, but uh, the naval units would be pretty quickly intercepted. Um, so you'll be placing subunits there. Um, then uh, finally, you have here uh, an action point track. So that's one for the Pacific Theatre. There would be a separate one for the European for each side. So, for example, the Commonwealth and the USA would have action points in both theatres, the Japanese and the Germans only in their respective theatre. Um, you have, as you can see up in Siberia, you have um, supply points marked. Also, um, Tokyo will be a supply point and I believe uh, Delhi is a supply point for the Commonwealth here. So Australia itself has um, two supply points, one here in Melbourne and one there in Perth. Um, then the next supply point is all the way over in America. So this is very important because um, so you can supply something as long as it's two hops away from a supply point. And uh, that's one hex on land or six of these mega hexes from port to port or port to, to single hex island. Now, so what that's going to mean is that um, America or the Allies uh, from Melbourne, there would be one to come into this mega hex. One, two, three, four five and then six so you see you, they cannot or even six to there but it would take another point to um as it were deactivate enter the port of trucks so um the u.s uh cannot supply truck directly from melbourne it would have to go to rabul that's what would be one hop and then another hop to truck say they had rabul then that would be one to enter this mega hex from the port two um three four five and then six in the sense that it could go to tokyo so tokyo uh can supply rabul in one one jump and then from rabul to melbourne so you can see if japan um was trying to invade melbourne it would be okay and from melbourne via rabul to japan or say if you had Iwo Jima and you wanted to, you were attacking Japan from there, for example, with strategic um, bombers with uh, your atom bombs um, available in 1945.
then um, that would be doable, but you would need rabul and you would need a clear supply route. So any naval unit in one of these hexes would block that supply, then you'd have to go around and you wouldn't have so far to get. Um, now you can extend that with um, headquarters hexes. So for example, uh, because Japan doesn't have Australia, so Japan always starts from here. So they could go one, two, three, four, five, and then say six into that port. I think that's right. Because th these hexes denote um, uh, straight hexes whereby you have to be, oh yeah, no, it's like you have to be on that side or that side of that hex. You, you cannot be in both, so it would take another movement in that mega hex to move around there. Um, and that's in another mega hex, so sorry, you would come from here to there. So Japan could go to Tarakan on one hop, or perhaps they come down here through to Brunei, and then one, two, three, four, five, six. So they could. Um, supply up to there and then attack into India but they couldn't attack supply directly to Delhi um, from Japan. Now if they um, had a, a headquarters unit there then that headquarters unit could provide two more hops so essentially um, into that port and then another hex there because now you're on land and then you'll need another headquarters there for two more uh, into Delhi. So you can see it's quite an expedition to do that. And of course that obviously works the other way for the, the Americans. So they um, would start from America. So um, you've got supply in San Francisco and also in Vancouver for the, the Commonwealth up there. Um, then uh, each of these uh, hexes on the uh, strategic map equals one of these mega hexes on the tactical map as it were. So um, that would be one, two, three, four. Now that brings us to PT 14, four, five, and then deactivate six. So that was one hop. And then you can for one, two, three, four, five, and then six to Rabaul. So as long as they have um, Howland and in their control and these hexes open, the US can supply to Rabaul. If they have in control of Rabaul, that's immediate supply and that route's open. Um, this is very important because when you build units and deploy them, you can deploy them on any hex immediately that um, they're deployable that is in supply. So um, uh, US units that will be built can immediately come here. Otherwise, if the Japanese have cut the islands um, through the island chains here and some of these single islands. There's no supply route there and the closest you could get would be Hawaii. You're not going to get much stack, stacking capability in Hawaii. You can only have one infantry or, or armor unit um, and one naval and one um, Oh, no, that's got a port, so you can have four naval and one air there. So um, in a normal land text, you could have two uh, infantry or armour or marine or airborne units. Um, so you can see then they would have to build them up here and here and ferry them across laboriously. And so you, that is how you get um, the Pacific campaign playing itself out. Um, it's interesting, I'll show you also on the strategic map, um, you have convoy routes here for the US and the Commonwealth. And so it's very possible um, for a Japanese uh, player to build submarines, have them move across here and uh, place themselves. You can have one in each convoy route and every um, impulse, so that's your turn essentially, you can roll the d6 on a... a a double six on a natural six, you would score two resource hits. On a a, a five, you would score one resource hit, um, and that's really helpful because, for example, America starts with twelve resources available in the Pacific, um, in the 
uh, grand uh, campaign that they have more. Um, Japan starts with seven. So you can see if Japan can get a couple of resource hits on America at the beginning of a turn, they already start with less resources. This is very important because every unit that is built um, it requires a resource. So for example, if you are American, you want to build, um, uh, let's say, a, a, a light bomber, um, a strategic bomber. You want to build a light bomber, very important forces. You would spend one resource to put it there, then later, uh, your next turn, another resource there, and then another resource there, and from there you can then deploy it. So it's going to take three resources for one uh, light bomber, and um, America is going to need to build a lot of units. They do not start with so much. They have um, uh, some here, some here, and then the standard sort of in, in Hawaii and the Philippines, and that's it. Um, the rest all come on as reinforcements. Now, reinforcements are a little bit different from what I said, because reinforcements you can build them straight, one resource, they go straight here, and then you just um, spend an action point to put them out on the map. But um, those are coming in slowly. In 1941, when we start, the, U the US is really waiting for these. As soon as Japan declares war on them, um, they're going to take uh, all of those units. They will enter what's called uh, the, yeah, I think it's the reinforcement pool. Um, and, uh, yes, uh, so the reinforcement pool. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and, okay. So, so yes, America will build them quite quickly, but you can see they need a lot of resources. Uh, they, they've got a lot, but they need it to get their forces on the board. And the thing is, is they're going to take a fair bit of punishment from Japan initially as well. What that means, when you get your reinforcements, they go here. With one resource, you can put them here and then build them and deploy them straight away. When a unit, and every unit has two um, hits, it's two steps essentially. Um, when it's uh, destroyed, it goes to the eliminated unit pool. But that now can be rebuilt. But this is when, when you build it, it comes on here. So one resource to there. Second resource, third resource, and you can only use one resource each turn, so it takes time. Um, each of your turns uh, takes time to do, and because America will be taking that beating, they will have lots of units that they need to rebuild completely. Um, so I find that very interesting because I've played um, Pacific Theatre games before where the Japanese don't get a chance to do that, and uh, it's nice to have that opportunity. Um, you also have on uh, the strategic display a radar display, on the strategic map a radar display. Now this is only for German raiders, so, raiders, so you don't actually need that in the, the Pacific Theatre game. So I'm going to use it to put my dice tray on. But again, it's just to illustrate another helpful and very simple thing um, which you can do. So it shows the Commonwealth um, and the US have some convoy routes here and the German raiders can go in there, they can move from, from, to, from zone to, to zone and um, uh, attack these convoys. Then the um, convoy escorts will come in and uh, you have to roll the die to see... I can't remember because I haven't actually done it, but it's something like you put your convoy escort there and then you roll the die and if you roll a one or two, or if it's in there and you roll a three or four, then you can attack the raiders. Otherwise, um, the raiders are going ahead. Um, so anyway, I, I haven't explained that well. I probably got it wrong, but that's the raider display. So what else do you get on this track? There was the production display, which I showed. And essentially, uh, you get your CVs and BBs all the way here. They start flipped, so they actually have to go all the way around. So that takes... 24 resources and 24 of your turns to build a CV or a, a battleship. And um, the other things you have, oh, there's a German raider, you have destroyers, um, submarines, strategic bombers. I think uh, Japan certainly doesn't have those. The uh, US does. I don't know if Commonwealth, I suppose they might. Not sure about Germany. Then armour, uh, light bombers, um, okay, Soviet rebuilds. 
um, should have been there, had to add it, uh, headquarters, marines, airborne, and then standard infantry. So standard infantry are built very quickly, um, even from eliminated. Uh, then you have the economic display. Um, so it has a Soviet Union, uh, Germany, Italy, Japan, France, Commonwealth and US on it. And then it, it, each box is numbered. And uh, this is where you place your resources, uh, your resource limit, and then your resource available um, for each nation. Um, I also have here markers for the nationalist China morale and the Maoist China morale. The morale of a nation comes in if uh, you conquer certain of its cities or capital. Or, uh, I can't remember the exact surrender rules, but um, if the country, if and when it surrenders. Um, uh, so you can see you also have a reinforcement limit. So I've marked them down here. So that's the number in any one season of reinforcements that you can place. So although you might build a whole swathe and have them waiting here, for example, Japan and the Commonwealth um, in this uh, have a reinforcement limit of two. America has five, the highest. Um, so Japan in 1939 would start here. It says there 1941, they start there, but in the scenario it says here because they have um, are considered to have gained um, French... Indochina already. Uh, so that's that display. Now the resources come, um, here you have the resource control display, so they come from places. So for example Australia is worth one resource to the Commonwealth. French Indochina was worth hmm, two resources, so that would suggest that should be there, but there you go. Um, a few glitches like that, I, I imagine they were caught in the one small step edition. Um, Japan itself only starts with two, then it also has Korea, Manchuria, etc. like that. So again, this is important because Japan will take US from the Philippines from the US. So that means the US um, limit will drop down one, although um, they're available can stay like that until they spent it. And the Japanese limit will go up one. Um, uh, then, so we have the eliminated unit pool, the reinforcements, so Japan has these waiting at the beginning, so does the Commonwealth, they can build them quickly. Japan also has three kamikaze units, those are essentially free builds, you can you just take off any other air unit, replace it with a kamikaze and deploy that straight away. Essentially what you're going to do is any eliminated air units, you'll immediately make into kamikaze so they can don't have to laboriously build them so you won't be doing that till the end of the game uh, um, uh, when you don't have a chance to rebuild um, your uh, land-based bombers oh yeah that's land-based not light bomber land-based um, because a CV unit has its own integral um, air units uh, the Japanese and the Americans they have they're considered very strong so they have two on their each of their um, carriers have we got a British carrier here no but the other f nations all have only one so um, they also have plus one versus naval uh, carrier because of the um, air forces um, that doesn't mean it, it's stronger in combat it just means that it can take more damage so it's essentially four steps instead of two steps of um, air. Uh, then you also have the transport pool. So the nations have rail transportation. Essentially that's just an abstraction in that at any point if you want to transport a unit by rail, um, normally in the Pacific Theatre, ground units are going to move one hex, that's it. They can't do anything else the turn. So each of those nations can tr move one quickly by rail like that. And then similarly sea transport. So essentially any uh, unit that's so for example you have headquarters and the marines there these marines are starting in port um, with these uh, naval units the naval units can activate form your task force they can bring those marines with them you would pick up the sea transport and then you'd move them you might end your turn at sea in which case you would pop a sea um, 
a task force marker on. And I, I've gone, because of, I, uh, just a quick note, I put red on all my Japanese because um, I'm a bit of a skimflint, um, more so in the past when I printed this out first in uh, um, printing, because printing does cost a lot, doesn't it? Um, this is the Commonwealth, and um, the Japanese should be kind of a, quite a bright pink, but some of mine came out very close to the Commonwealth, so I, I marked them with a dot. I also marked the task force markers are the same. I marked these with red so I can distinguish, you know, is that a, uh, for example, just say, that's, that's not a Japanese task force, that is a Japanese task force, otherwise they would both look the same. You know, it just saves a bit of counter hunting. I also marked this one ST to say there's a sea transport there. The reason why is if you are transporting um, units, you cannot intercept nor screen with them as a task force. Um, so if I had another task force in here without, um, let's just say, without a sea transport, and um, it was, okay, it was a Japanese task force. And then there was, in the same mega hex, there was a, uh, um, a, a just, just say that's a, a, a Commonwealth task force. Then this one might want to attack that, but this one can screen that one. Or this one could not screen that one. So this one would have to be attacked first. Okay, I guess that's pretty obvious. Okay, I've lost where those go. I have to set them back up. Um, so the sea transport um, will be used up while it is in use. Um, and that is, so that's important. So Japan can have three fleets at sea with um, marines or, or armour or infantry or even, no, I don't think that the Japanese get an airborne unit um, at sea. As soon as it lands... Wherever it lands, if it does a successful invasion or, or it lands in a Japanese-owned place, um, he disembarks and that um, transportation marker, wherever it is, oh, I've lost it already, will go straight back, um, straight back here so, to be reused again. So it's just abstractive, it makes it nice and quick, easy and simple. It's a very clean system like that. So... Um, Japan needs those. There's no transporting by destroyers, which I was looking for, because you know often that's the case. Japan is a slight, because they did that um, in other games that they can, but it's not avail available here. Um, so you see, the US only has two. So I can't remember if they build them. No, they don't. So they it's a bit slow getting out their infantry. Um, Interesting, I hadn't noticed that before. That the, the... But um, the, the Commonwealth can loan them, so between them they've got four essentially against the Jap Japanese three. Uh, then you have the turn display. So the game is played in seasons, and yes, you could start in 39. Um, we're starting in a spring of 41. We've got a marker here. Japan can attack China once a season um, until they declared war on America. If they attack China more than once a season prior to that, then America will enter the war against the Japanese. I guess they would declare war against them. Um, so that's just a reminder for that. Um, then you also have the current player track. So that's to mark, uh, this is the turn order. So you get the Soviet Union, then the Axis powers, then the Western Axis powers, and then unallied minor powers. That would be, in our case here, um, Maoist and Nationalist China. Um, also, the, the in fact, the, the Dutch East Indies, when they come out, um, are actually controlled by um, the Commonwealth. Um, yeah, so that's not absolutely clear to me. That not, might not be a fault of the rules, but just my memory. Um, okay, so anyway, that's the turn order. And then in every season, we have three impulses. So essentially what that means, at the start of the season, you have a few bookkeeping things to do. One is the very, in our case, the very important other theatre commitment pool. So that's OT commitment pool. 
Um, then you go to the first impulse. So uh, in our game, then Japan will get an impulse, then the Commonwealth, then the US, then the Chinas. And then we go back and we go to the second impulse, Japan, and so forth like that. So you have three impulses in a season. Then you have the end of the season, some bookkeeping stuff to do. And then you would move to the next season. Now, every season um, you can bring in your reinforcement limit. So that's one distinction that is important there. Um, and uh, units that task forces that stay at sea at the end of a season are marked low fuel. If at the end of a, the next season they are still at sea, marked low fuel, they are eliminated. So essentially any task force um, has to do what it's going to do within two seasons, but you get three turns essentially three player turns each season so that's six turns so that's six bunches of possibilities of doing stuff which is quite a lot for a task force um submarines themselves don't have that low fuel so you, your submarines can remain on patrol over here miles away from japan or indeed all around japan miles away from america for as long as you like again it's an abstraction it works really well um so that's the way that goes. So in every season, although you have separate player turns, they go in impulses. So it is sort of quite interleaved, but at the same time, it's it's a big sort of I go, you go. I'll get to that in just a minute. Now to the other theatre commitment pool. This is extremely important because, um, and this is one thing, a minor great, but you get you get this. I don't know what it's like on the one small step one, but you get a big space like this in which to put at maximum okay seventy units, and I stack them in stacks of five. Um, that's probably the minimum you'd want to to do it. So see at a glance how many you've got there. You need this information at the end of each season, and uh, it's in the book. It's it's not on there, and it's not on here in this huge space. Stick it on there. Why not? Okay, so 1941, the Commonwealth has to roll two dice. On uh, two to five, they will lose one of these um, units in the other theatre. So these are fighting in Europe. Uh, the US doesn't worry, and it, but then starting in 42, the US starts rolling two dice. On a six, you will lose two units. So in 1941, the Brits will lose one or two units. Uh, the same in 42, but so are the US. So potentially, in bad rolls, you could lose four units a turn. Now, you must keep this as a minimum in the theatre or else you lose the game. So it's considered, you know, that you lost in the other theatre and um, and consequently uh, it's decisive in this theatre too. So um, the Allies have to constantly feed this because they have to have a minimum of 24 um, at the end of each season and you check at the beginning of the next season and they start with 24 so you can see at the beginning of the spring season they're going to lose one maybe two and in 42 they're going to lose probably two maybe three possibly four uh, and, and and in 42 they have to have 30 minimum so not only are they going to have to replace their losses, but they're going to have to feed new units that are coming in as their reinforcements and when they are declared war at. Now, the Brits do start with some reinforcements there. Some of those are going to have to be built straight into here. Pretty sharpish. If you're crazy, you know, you might say, oh, forget that. I Hopefully I'm lucky. But then you're going to roll a six or even two, three, four sixes and kablam. You've lost the game. So that's the attrition check, and those are the thresholds. Very important stuff. Um, and so, again, that's where the seasons come in. So you can see you do get three impulses in which to sort that out. And now the impulse thing we come to. So in an impulse, so say it's Japan's foot impulse one, that's the spring season. They start, oh, sorry, where are we? They start, yes, I moved that, didn't I? So... Um, okay, say it's another season, they've, they've got um, the Philippines, so their resources, so they go up to one, the limit's gone, but this is their available. Um, they start at seven available resources. Now they can spend one, 
And with that, they can do, um, they can buy action points, they can build units, uh, they can do, if you were German, you could raid convoys in the convoy raiding display. You could strategic bomb that if you were the allies, um, not the Japanese in this, and also partisans would come in again, not the case in this theatre. But so essentially this theatre, you have two things you could do. You could spend this and you get action points. You essentially get four action points plus what's called your nationality modifier. Forgot to mention that. It's either zero, one or two. Germany gets two. Everybody else gets one or zero. Um, and uh, that is added to the actions you get to do a turn. So Japan will get five. And it is also crucially added to every attack uh, and defense role you make. So um, that is a big, a big deal, the nationality modifier. And again, it very um, simply and elegantly performs a, a, a big effect for defense combat and uh, available actions. Now, one interesting thing is that in spring and summer in the uh, Pacific Theatre, it's monsoon, so you don't get to add your nationality modifier. So because we're in spring, say at the moment, Japan will only get four, they won't get that extra one. Four action points, or what they could do, they have the reinforcements. So instead of taking those action points, they spend that resource and then they will take a reinforcement, for example, a CV. Because it's a reinforcement, it is Im immediately this deploys when built. And so they can place it in any of those supplied hexes, a supplied and controlled hexes. So uh, Japan has some land-based air, two CVs and a battleship to build or take actions. And essentially they, um, they're going to want to take two impulses doing stuff in China and building, reinforcing, and then the third impulse they're going to want to perform the Pearl Harbor attack for which they get sp some special bonuses. And then America will enter the war. Um, uh, and and or they, they will be attacking the Philippines. Um, so, you know, they get a chance to do something in, in China, Burma, uh, no, not Burma, because that would be attacking um, the Commonwealth, and I think that would bring America in. Again, I'm not fully sure of all the details of the ins and outs, but uh, it is all, all in here. Um, I say, I say that like I saw, thought it, I said that. I'm sure it is, because like I said, the, the rules are... are um, they, they do feel pretty comprehensive. I, I find that um, questions that I've had are answered. It's just sh trying to find out where they are. So, um, for example, just to give you a feel of how it is, um, you've got at the back, you've got all the uh, countries, as it were, the powers listed. So Norway, Netherlands, Japan, Italy, Hungary. Greece, the Axis powers, the Commonwealth. Yeah, so the Commonwealth is a Western allied major power. So, um, yeah, so, ah, so the US is only if they're, if it is at war with the Axis. Ah, so I think Japan could attack the Commonwealth. Um, prior to, to, to the US coming in and it would not bring them in. So you see there are certain little rules of the Atlantic Charter, Six Creek, and how liberation happens. And then also um, you've got weather, you've got fortresses. Terrain's right at the back, interestingly enough, but terrain is, is very simple, especially in the Pacific. Essentially, um, you've got the sea, you've got the islands, and then clear terrain. This train, this doesn't affect movement, it just is a, is a man of some combat. Uh, control, surrender, resources, cooperation, yeah, so allies, so you can give resources. And somewhere there's also declarations of war. 
Okay. Okay, so yeah, you see some powers, minor powers, etc. So there it is, and you can see there are illustrated examples of play. Like, for example, there's an amphibious assault given for you, and those examples of play are very helpful. And they do actually, um, some people be niggled by this, they do actually illustrate what isn't always spoken of in the rules. So, for example, um, task forces, the rules say you would spend, let's get to that now. So say, okay, Japan spends one of its resource points and um, so it uses a reinforcement CV and it's going to place it uh, in truck as long as it's not over the stacking we could have, because we have a port there we can have four naval units there's already three so yes we can have a fourth um spent one resource for that and then it spends another resource um to get four action points in this case now um spends one action point and it activates those naval forces so then they move out into the mega hex let's say they're going to take um becomes a task force i'm going to put this camera down so it's not what annoyingly flapping okay there you go um it becomes a task force and it now has um it's activated and naval units uniquely they then have um four NMPs, naval movement points or options, they can do four things. One is to activate, so spent that, leaves the port. Then one would be to move to another uh, uh, mega hex. Then it could, if in there, it could roll to detect. If it detects, it could then spend another to attack a naval force there. And then it could maybe move to another mega hex. Or, uh, so that, that would be four. One, for example, two, uh, sorry, one to here, two to there. It's still in the naval hex, and now it's going to perform a, um amphibious assault using the marine unit. Um, that would be three. And say the marine's successful, then it could go four back to there. Um... Or, for example, it could uh, move one, two to there, and then it could perform an airstrike on Rabaul, and then after that, um, uh, the uh, uh, amphibious assault. So Then, um, say it does the amphibious assault, and then it could even move further onto there. Ah, uh, hang on, no, because it does the amphibious assault, it's going to be um, marked acted. Okay, correction. So uh, it essentially it could um, move four and um, then it would be finished or it could move and then either attack a naval force, perform a carrier airstrike or launch an amphibious assault. Either of those three things would finish it for that turn. So um, say it launches the assault, uh, it, it is acted. Now remember that's one impulse, it can't do anything else, it can defend um, uh, this impulse. But you've got two more of those in the season. So now you've still got three action points left as the Japanese. That's acted also because it has um, performed that assault. Um, then you would look around and you might say, okay, say the um, Marines uh, were successful. Oops, it is it. Sorry, my tripod there is wobbling. Um, then you could, for example, so he's got uh, this port here. Then you could spend another action point, move a ferry um, or strategic rebase in other games, the air unit. Um, and then maybe you could activate this with um, uh, another sea transport, bring that in. That would be uh, two more um, action points. And um, then you've got one action point left. 
and you might look somewhere else and perhaps perform an attack um, uh, into uh, nationalist China with these units here. And the attack would work in essentially um, this... Okay, some special rules for the conscript forces in nationalist China there. They essentially come and go quickly and uh, can't attack and move back. Um, so, uh, an attack would happen like this. So this fellow, say, would attack. These two would support. This um, land base could support, and even this one. You would roll the d6, you would add 1 for that. 2, 3 for the supporting. 5, 6 um, for the land-based. And so what's that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for all those supporting and attacking unit. Then minus 1 because of the terrain, that's 4. Plus 1 because of the nationality modifier, that's 5. Then you would roll the d6, and if you get 6 to 9, you do 1 hit. If you get 9 to... Um, sorry, 10 to 13, that's 2 hits, 14 to 17, 3 hits, and so on. So, um, and then all, all those units and um, supporting ones would count as acted themselves. They couldn't then go on to do um, movements and... Uh, 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 attacks themselves. In the Pacific theater, if you just if a unit just moves once, it's acted as well. In the um, European theater, a unit can move, and it could normally move, say, two hexes. If it moves one, it's only moved, and then it could fight or support another. If it moved two, it would be acted, and it can't. So you see, it's a bit slower in the Pacific theater. But so essentially, anyway, so that one unit acting and all the other supporting, that would just be one action. And so that would be um, the four action points spent by the Japanese. And then, But then you look here and you say, OK, so um, we started here. We uh, spent a build point for reinforcement, another action point for uh, another resource for um, four action points. We could spend more. We could go all the way down to zero here. And you might do that. So you might then spend another action point, get four more resources, activate some more units, maybe another attack here, move some of these units out and so forth. And then you might do it again. And then you might do it again. And then you spend quite a lot of action points. You finish and you go, OK, and then you regenerate resources available. But you only regenerate um, this for every three of these plus one fractions rounded up so we're on eight so essentially that's going to count as nine so we get three plus one so we would get one two three four back so you can see if you you can operate at a very high um momentum but you're burning up your resources and you won't be able to replace them quickly. You'll have to spend several turns without that momentum to build them all the way back up to your full limit. Or else, you know, if you keep doing that, each turn you're gradually going to regenerate less until you've hardly got any. Um, so you might just operate within your cycle. You might operate greater than your cycle and regenerate a little bit for a while and then hope you can catch up later. But you have to always be aware of your, those convoy attacks, especially if the USS, if the US has got subs out and they're doing resource hits to you, you might actually start here. So, you know, you need to regenerate up. You might only, you might only spend a few and you're getting very low down. So that's how that works. And you can see you can regenerate back up to your new limit once you've conquered new areas. So that would be the end of the Japanese um, first impulse. Then we would, in this, our case, we would go to the Commonwealth impulse and they would do the same. But you see they have less resources available in this theatre. And um, then the US would do the same and they're not going to have so much to do to start with. They can deploy, but they, they don't have any units to deploy or to start building uh, um, until um, they enter the war. And so then you do three of those impulses, then you go to the end of the season. Now, as I said, at the end of the season, you will, um, you will, uh, countries that lost their capital may surrender, then you would roll for their morale. So, for example, if Japan had managed to reach um, Yunnan in Maoist China, you would roll 
uh, two dice and if you are getting um, seven or below they won't surrender they will continue fighting uh, like that and uh, the nationalist China's capital is down here so you can come up from here and Japan has it's got a fairly decent chance at least to capture one part of China but it's it only takes a long time especially in nationalist China because they keep regenerating and um, you kind of want to do it quick because you want to free up those infantry units to bring them out for invasions around here but it doesn't go as quickly as you'd like and that's an uh, interesting design feature in this is you, you don't have unlimited builds so there's a limit to the builds that are available you have what is on the map you have what comes in as reinforcements um, already and anything is eliminated you can rebuild but beyond that you cannot build so Japan has quite a fixed number of um, uh, infantry units now that so that hampers them in conquests however it does you might think it would hamper them in holding their gains but that doesn't that's a nifty rule as well which again illustrates this the kind of grace with which this game um, performs itself um, say uh, that um, Japan had taken the one hex island originally belonging to the Americas. Let's just choose a different one for a change. Howland there. Oops, sorry about this. My, I've got one of those silly monkey tripods. My other broke. <laughs> anyway, um, Howland there. Uh, this becomes Japanese controlled. Now they might want, they could put a one naval, one land and one air in it and also headquarters if necessary. That's their maximum stacking. Or they could just leave it like that. What's to stop America just waltzing straight in and taking it? Well, um, you cannot just attack uh, a one hex island. You have to um, amphibious assault it. You would also amphibious assault um, coastal uh, masses of other um, greater than one hex islands but the point be being particularly for one hex islands because you know there's so many you cannot garrison them all with the given units you roll for an attrition check so you roll the, for the banding attrition um, on the charts and tables you roll d6 four plus it's intact two or three it lands but it takes a hit if there's a unit there, it is then going to have to combat it, and it may not be successful. It may end up staying on the transports. It's not just necessarily eliminated. Or on a one or less, it is eliminated before combat. Now you get a modifiers. So um, you get the assault unit's nationality modifier. If the target hex is a fortress, you get minus two for that. So that is the case of... Singapore and truck and I guess there are fortresses on the um, European theatre as well uh, then airborne assault okay that's modifies amphibious assaults if you are an MR that's a marine unit you get plus two so you can see a marine units guaranteed just to take a, a step loss it will take that island um, but it might take a step loss and that's very important because uh, like I said, with the counter limit, so the US gets one marine in 1943, and they get infantry before that on the declaration. Of war. And again, the Japanese have one marine unit, the Commonwealth have none. So, you and if that if it invades two one hex islands, takes two step losses, it's gone, then you have to rebuild it. Again, that's going to cost resources, so you, it will come back. It's not a, a limit for the game, but it's a limit in capability, very nicely um, handled. And then you get, so you can flip your friendly headquarters to supply. Um, again, you, so you could use a headquarter twice, but then it'll be gone, it'd have to be rebuilt. So again, you know, it's all these things are simply and neatly um, baked in then there's one modifier the crucial one because i think they weren't concentrating the pacific pacific theater for this um 
player aid, minus two versus Japanese controlled islands. So that beautifully um, cancels out the uh, plus two for the American Marines and it evens up the odds so the Marines could easily be eliminated. So you can see the Japanese, they, they are, have already got, without having to put any um, infantry unit in there, they've already got a significant abstracted force dug in and defending um, against uh, any invading unit. Um, that's that's it. I, th I, I don't want to go into the details of the rules except to say, it w uh, yes, I should go into certain things like, for example, especially important are um, things like the coordination between, uh, you could have, in, in a mega hex, if a task force spends uh, a naval movement point, so does any action in that, a mega hex. Any other um, unit in that mega hex can try and detect it from the enemy's side. Now you can add them up. So standard detection is to roll a five on a d six, but you get plus one for every extra who, who's doing that. So say um, if Japan tries to move through this mega hex around Malaya, the Brits can use their land base there to try and search. So on a five plus, they will find it. If there was a, an allied submarine in there, then that would add plus one. If there was a task force, that would add plus one. And if there was also... Um, uh, that's it, essentially. So naval, submarine and air, you, you can add in those extras as chances to detect. Otherwise, um, task forces can move past each other undetected. Um... What else do I need? Uh... Oh, and Coast Watchers, that was it. I knew there was something I was missing. So also Coast Watchers. So for example, if you control an area, you're considered to have Coast Watchers. So for example, Malaya, the Coast Watchers would be the basic. Then you'd get plus one for having the air. Then you potentially could have plus uh, one plus one for air, plus one for subs, plus one for naval. So that would essentially, you would detect on a roll of two or more. And so you can see detection can be quite automatic, but it's never certain, and it can, or it could be quite risky if you just have two naval forces passing each other in the night, as it were. They will only have a chance of five or six on a D6, each one. And you, in that case, you can get naval surprise. Um, so you could attack the other and he would take damage before he rolls his defence dice. Attack should make some that is very quick and simple. Essentially you roll a d6. I sort of mentioned it earlier. You will add one for the unit that is attacking. You will add the nationality modifier. Um, any bonuses, for example, battleships against navals get plus two. Um, and then every supporting unit could be air, could be... Um, uh, adjacent ground units, for example, uh, then something for subs, and then if you've got terrain and if there's a fortress, and then you, you could inflict one, zero, one, two, or three hits, and if you roll six, you yourself take attrition. So that is how the nationalists um, uh, chip away at the Japanese. They don't actually roll a defense die, but the J Japanese might take attrition in taking them out. Submarines themselves, if they're raiding convoys, they don't take attrition. So again, they can sit out there for a long time. I haven't perfected yet how you'll search and use destroyers to search out subs, but that can happen. Um, and so I guess just one more thing to say, because this has gone on for quite a long time, is... Um, Here's, here's, here's the actions you can do. So I divided it up into ground, naval, sub, and miscellaneous. So it's essentially move and or fight, raid, um, rebuild, um, perform airstrikes. Then these are fr free actions is movement and rebuild, but um, they require resources for the builds. Then you have paid actions where you pay those action points. Um, that, that's essentially like perform an airstrike, ferry air units, um, 
uh, embark on a rail or sea transport, etc. Um, move, activate a naval unit, move a SARP, uh, and then some dis miscellaneous actions like declaring war, etc. Um, and then just some one-off special actions like declare the Pearl Harbor raid. Um, so that's it. There's there's a lot of options available. All the ones you would usually expect in a game of this scope, um, in terms of uh, expending resources and then in this game spending action points. So you you don't, you don't automatically move all your units. You have to determine how many resources you're going to use, to how many units you can then how many actions you can have. Which that would, if it was ground, you would activate the hex and move um, a hex of units or um, two individual units, depending on how your forces are arrayed. Um, so I, I think that's it. Um, Okay, so, uh, we do have a helpful summary, um, somebody on Board Game Geek produced this, so how combat works, so for example, what happens when a ground unit wants to fight a ground unit, or an air unit, what if an air unit wants to fight a ground unit, naval to ground, it's because you have naval bombardments on amphibious invasions, Subs to ground, no direct combat, no, but um, uh, you know, you can display subs if, if you enter their port hex and so forth. Um, so that's all detailed there again. That's another handy summary, which it's a shame companies don't do more of that kind of thing prior to production. But anyway, I don't want to detract anything from this, uh, I think, very elegant and um, comprehensive game and game system. Um, I uh, hope you found this quite useful and uh, if you want to see more detail then please follow the uh, example of play video to follow. Over and out.